We've already talked about spectra. A spectrum of a star can reveal a star's composition, temperature, luminosity, its speed, its uh, rotation on its axis, and other properties. So remember that we've got light that's moving through the gas of the star's surface layers. Um, the atoms in that atmosphere are going to absorb radiation at some wavelengths of light. That's an absorption spectra. So you remove some parts of the um, full rainbow of the electromagnetic spectrum, and you create those dark absorption lines in um, the star's spectrum. And every atom creates its own unique set of absorption lines. So determining a star's surface composition is a matter of matching a star's absorption lines to those that we know for atoms, like from a laboratory, for example. So here is the solar spectrum, okay? And this is the spectrum of light coming from our own sun. So we can see that there's a lot of absorption features in here. From these absorption features, we can pin down the sun's surface temperature and um, what spectral type of star it is. Now, since stars emit light at all wavelengths of light, that entire spectrum of light that the star emits, the continuous spectrum of light that a star emits is what we call its black body spectrum. That's just the name it's given. Okay, so let's say that we have a particular star and here is the, um, the spectra of that star, the, the continuous spectra before any absorption or emission occurs. So this axis here is the intensity. How intense is that light at a particular wavelength that the star is emitting? And so this particular star is emitting most strongly near visible wavelengths of light. Okay, so this would be the visible part of our spectra. Here's the wavelength. So we've got longer wavelengths over here, shorter wavelengths on this end. Now, as this light passes through the star's atmosphere, Atoms will absorb photons of certain wavelengths, and that causes the absorption lines in the stellar spectrum. So then from this nice, beautiful spectrum we see here, you're going to start to see um, um, some of those absorption lines, some of those black lines where um, that wavelength of the light has been absorbed by material in the atmosphere of the star. But atoms in the hot outer atmosphere of stars can also become excited and emit photons themselves, and those call, um, cause emission lines in the spectra of some stars. So then you would see stronger peaks of the intensity of light coming from some stars at some particular wavelengths because of emission spectra as well. So the combination of absorption and emission spectra from the star tells us what the star is made up of, among other things. So a sci scientists began to realize in sort of the mid to late 1800s that you could observe these patterns of spectra from stars and learn a little bit more about them or at least you could determine that some stars are like each other and some stars are not like each other. Um, different stars have different spectral line patterns. The first attempt to organize and classify stars by their, by their spectra looked in particular at the absorption of hydrogen. Stars were originally classified by letters A through O based on the strength of the absorption lines of hydrogen. So A was a star that um, had the strongest absorption lines of hydrogen, and O were stars that had um, the weakest absorption lines of hydrogen. So here we have the original four classes of stellar spectra dating back to the 1870s. Uh, and so we've got here Sirius, the brightest star in our night sky. This is the spectra that we get from that star, only a very few um, absorption features. And then um, here's our sun, okay, lots of absorption features. And um, here are uh, the absorption features of a couple of other stars down here. Annie Jump Cannon discovered that the spectral classes were more orderly in appearance if arranged by temperature. So because all the original spectra were uh, labeled A through O based on the um, strongest hydrogen emission to the weakest, but that didn't necessarily mean that the temperatures were in order with those numbers. So what she did was arranged the sequence of stellar, stellar uh, spectra by the temperature of those stars. 
And then the reordered sequence became O, B, A, F, G, K, M, with O here being the hottest stars and M being the coolest stars. And today, these are what we call stellar spectral types. So our hottest stars are spectral type O stars, um, our coolest stars are spectral type M stars, and actually our sun is a spectral type of G right here. So our sun is a G type um, when we're thinking about stellar spectra. So in order to remember this pattern, O, B, A, F, G, K, M, a lot of people will come up with what we call a mnemonic, um, which helps them remember those letters. And so the one that I learned when I took my first astronomy class was, oh, be a fine girl or guy, kiss me. And um, that would give, help me remember the order of the spectral type from hottest to coolest was O, B, A, F, G, K, uh, M. But you could come up with your own um, mnemonic to help you remember the ordering of the spectral types from hottest to coolest stars. And then after Annie Jump Cannon came Cecilia Payne, and she demonstrated the physical connection between the temperature of stars and the resulting absorption lines. So she helped to understand why the temperature of stars were related to the particular absorption lines that we see of hydrogen and, and other elements too. Here is our modern classification for stellar spectral type. Okay, so we have our O spectral type, the hottest, okay? And then we have our uh, absorption features. And some of these we can pick out as particular elements. Um, here are the helium absorption lines and then the hydrogen absorption, absorption lines, okay? And so um, as we go from O, B, A, at A we start to see that some of these absorption lines become really broad. And then we get down to F and then they start to change. Um, we start to see uh, less of these broad hydrogen absorption lines in F and G stars. And then down here in K stars, you start to see um, a very strong peak in this particular absorption line of helium, um, and this one down here too. And in M spectral type stars, you see a lot of absorption lines. These are the coolest stars down here. And um, we've also got tit titanium oxide labeled down here too, which really only the cooler stars start to show those absorption line features. So here's a summary of what we've learned about the spectral type of stars and their temperature and their spectra. O stars are very hot and they have weak hydrogen absorption lines and that indicate that hydrogen is in a very highly ionized state. It's very excited, okay? A stars have just the right temperature to put electrons into hydrogen's second energy level above the nucleus, the orbital shell above the nucleus, which, which results in strong absorption lines in the visible part of the spectrum. And then F, G, and K stars are of low enough temperature to show absorption lines of, of metals like calcium, iron, and elements that are typically ionized in hotter stars. So um, a, a lot of times in astronomy, when we say something is a metal, we just mean that it's not hydrogen or helium in particular. And then K and M stars are cool enough that they actually start to form molecules and their absorption bands become evident. So that was the titanium oxide that we saw those absorption lines from in our K and M stars in the previous slide. Here we've stacked up the spectra of stars from hottest to coolest. And uh, we see here the sun is what we call a G2 spectral type. And that's its spectra right there. So this is a summary of what we've talked about so far in this mini lecture set. From Earth, we can measure a star's parallax, apparent brightness, and its spectrum, okay? And from just these pieces, we can get the star's distance, luminosity, radius, spectral type, surface temperature, and composition. All of those things we can get just by observing the light coming from that star. So from the parallax angle, if we take the um, distance to that star is equal to, in parsecs is equal to one over the parallax angle, we can get at the distance of the star, okay? And then if we figure out the brightness or the apparent brightness of the star, 
and we can figure out its luminosity and we can plug in the distance into that equation as well and then that will give us the luminosity of the star and then from the spectrum of the star we can find its spectral type and also tells us about its chemical composition and then the spectral type is really important to help us get the surface temperature of the star and then we can plug that into uh, our equation for luminosity where luminosity is equal to 4 pi r squared the surface area of a star times the stefan boltzmann constant times temperature to the power of 4 and that gives us the radius of a star so from these equations in blue and these observations in pink we can get at all these little green pieces here to learn more about stars we're going to end here by talking about what we call the hertzsprung russell diagram we're going to link the luminosity radius temperature and spectral type of a star so in the early 1900s astronomers einar hertzsprung and henry norris russell independently discovered a relationship between the luminosity and surface temperature of stars today we summarize this in the one of the most important plots for astronomers the hertzsprung russell diagram also known as the hr diagram so with our telescopes we can measure the luminosity and the spectrum for each star and their distance and then we can from the spectrum in particular to dedu deduce the star's temperature and so what we can do is knowing the luminosity of the star and we plot the luminosity of the star on the vertical axis and we plot the temperature of the star on the horizontal axis and all the stars in our universe start to line up in a particular pattern in a particular way which is really really interesting and it tells us a lot more about the physics that's going on inside these stars which is all the same so here is our hertzsprung russell diagram um, most of the stars on the hr diagram lie along a smooth diagonal line running from hot luminous stars up here in the upper left to cooler dimmer stars in the lower right and we call all the stars along this main branch stars on the main sequence so in our hertzsprung russell diagram right here we've got the luminosity of the star on the vertical axis um, stars that are very low luminosity are at the bottom stars with high luminosity are, are at the top and then we've got temperature on the bottom axis it's actually reverse of what you might think um, the way that we put together the hertzsprung russell diagram temperature the hottest stars are actually to the left here and the coolest stars are actually to the right and we also have the spectral type labeled here so hotter stars are o cooler stars are m okay and the hotter stars are blue cooler stars are red so we've also got the color here too on this particular hr diagram okay and also there it's hard to see but there are some lines here which indicate the radius of the star so these stars that are near the top of the hr diagram also have larger radii than the stars that are towards the bottom of the hr diagram and so all the stars that are living out the majority of their lives lie here along the main sequence now this is where most of the stars in our universe reside is along this main sequence when a star is on the main sequence of the hertzsprung russell diagram that star is fusing hydrogen into helium in its core just like our own sun is doing okay and so the very important piece of information here is that all stars are born on this hr diagram main sequence all stars are born along the main sequence and as they age they migrate off the main sequence so as a star ages it's not going to move along the spine of the main sequence no and instead as the star ages it starts to pop off and it becomes either a giant or a super giant star or at the end of its lifetime at the uh, very end of its lifetime it might become a white dwarf down here okay so and also the hr diagram is arranged by um by lifetime of the star as well it turns out that the coolest smallest least luminous stars actually live the longest lives um, so in stars that are the the brightest biggest hottest actually live the shortest lives so these stars up here o type stars uh, have lifetimes of only 10 to the 7 years 
Whereas when we come down here to a star like our sun, right here is where the sun sits on the HR diagram. Our sun has a lifetime of about 10 to the 10 years, okay? And then these tiny, tiny stars down here, actually some of the smallest M dwarfs, uh, sometimes we call stars along the main sequence dwarfs. So some of the smallest M dwarfs, M spectral type stars, actually have ages that are projected to be longer than the current age of our universe. So these stars are going to be fusing hydrogen into helium for an incredibly long time. And that's another reason why it's kind of a good uh, candidate to look for um, habitable worlds around M dwarfs because we know those M dwarfs have long lifetimes, and that gives life a better chance of being able to form around those planets. There are three main stellar types, as indicated by our HR diagram. We've got the main sequence stars, and then we have giant stars up here, and then we've got white dwarfs. And another thing about stars along the HR diagram is that they have different um, interior structures. So for example, stars along the main sequence, these larger, hotter stars, stars that are larger than about 1.5 times the sun's mass, have a convective core and a radiative outer shell. Whereas stars that are uh, of our sun's mass and up to 1.5 times the sun's mass or down to about 0.4 times our sun's mass, actually have um, the radiative interior, like we've already talked about, and an upper convection zone. And then once you get to stars down here, the really tiny smallest stars that are less than about 0.4 solar masses, maybe 0.3 solar masses, those stars are fully convective in their interior. And where you find convection, you find magnetism. So actually, it's these small little baby stars down here, these little M dwarfs, that are generating the strongest magnetism of most of the stars that we see in our universe. It's not the biggest stars that are generating the strongest magnetism that's observed. It's actually these little M dwarfs down here, which is really interesting and something that we're trying to learn more about. There's also a, a relationship that we call the mass luminosity relationship for a star. Main sequence stars obey this relationship, which is given approximately by the fact that the luminosity of the star is equal to its mass to the power of three. So um, if, if L and M here are measured in solar units, so one solar luminosity is one, our sun, one solar mass is one, our sun. And so if you have a greater mass, you're going to have a larger luminosity is what this um, equation is telling us. If you have a greater mass than our sun, you're going to have a larger luminosity than our sun. If you have a smaller mass than our sun, you're going to have a smaller luminosity than our sun. Um, so the consequence is that stars at the top of our main sequence uh, of the HR diagram are more massive than stars that are lower down. 